last time right we were uh, so I, I just finished telling you about stereo right so 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 stereo actually gives you a cue for depth right if you are interested in you know in depth right so we saw that if you actually translate a camera then then you saw that equation right last time that we had derived so what was actually a disparity so when you talk about stereo talk about talk about a disparity map right as it is called and uh, we are not we are not going to we are not going to say talk about it in detail but uh, so disparity map so you get this uh, so what was that so you had an equation for z right that is dependent that is just dependent on the focal length the baseline and xr minus xl right this is called a disparity or in other words it shows that xr xr minus xl is inversely proportional to z which means that points that are closer will have a disparity that is larger and points that are farther right will have a disparity that is smaller okay that is what in fact gives you a cue for depth right because the way these pixels move in the image but then this again is not it's not such an easy problem <coughs> not looks like well I mean if i do this then i'm done but then what really is the catch uh, the catch really you know lies in the fact that you have these uh, you have a left image you have a right image right and you have actually assumed that you have moved just translated the camera in plane okay so let's say maybe only along x and uh, and you so in the so in which case you even know as to where to search for right oops so so even know as to as to what you need to so you even know that uh, you even know that right that this sort of a correspondence it lies <coughs> like you know lies in the same row on the other image but again right, to be able to able to able to say that with a reasonable amount of uh, the confidence is it's not easy because to again you may have to run through some feature correspondences you may have to use some existing sift or something in order to be able to tell which feature is going where right so you need to be able to establish this correspondence and uh, and you can imagine it needs to be a very very dense kind of correspondence right then only you will have a depth map that is going to look look dense so all of that is not easy hmm? so mm, so i'm saying that you know, it's not like stereo is you know is all done and solved and all okay so even there are open issues in stereo they've been they've been they've been around for a long time okay and people are still figuring out ways by which you can actually improve this uh, improve this accuracy of stereo and uh, and these techniques right despite the fact that the, your uh, laser based you know range finders and all that right, they've all come but still image based depth map estimation is, is still remains very attractive because simply because of the spatial resolution that it offers and uh, the fact that it's so very cheap right all that you need are a uh, two images captured by a simple camera right whereas there you have to spend i mean the, those uh, say laser based equipments and all are still very very expensive right i mean you can't you can't really carry them around and so on so that way when when right, when they say people thought those things have come and then at right, one day they will take over all the image based reconstruction techniques and all right that didn't happen and even today people are still looking at using images to basically build a th uh, build a, a 3d depth map now uh, despite the fact that this is an image processing course right i'm still talking about this because since you have understood how the image formation happens both through a pinhole so the stereo and all right one thing that you have to you have to realize is that whenever you use stereo right it assumes that all these images are perfectly focused okay that's an underlying assumption uh, which uh, which means that even if you have a lens based camera and all right it doesn't worry about all that it just assumes that whatever you are capturing is absolutely in focus because the moment something begins to get blurred then even to associate correspondence and all is not easy right so for example in one image if the, if this guy is sharp and in the other image if that becomes blurred then for us to be able to you know associate this uh, or get a feature correspondence that will make it all the more tough right so all these algorithm most of them right that uh, for example stereo or structure from motion or for uh, photometric stereo for that matter they all assume that assume that what you have captured are all images that are absolutely in focus uh, no what 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 we want is both images ought to be focused okay both the both the images ought to ought to be focused no 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 it's it's like this right i mean you know when you when you say right both are at the same depth right i mean so what you are saying is you see you are only you are only going to say translating the camera right and you are and you are capturing capturing two images now the way you are actually constructing those whole whole equation is by assuming that you are doing an in plane translation and therefore right you are capturing one image with respect to the first uh, camera position then you are capturing another with respect to the second camera position now that is right based upon that we had this equation and then we said that you know you can compute z but the point is right what we are saying is but all of this assumes that see this this basically assumes that you can get xr minus xl 
But what is XR minus XL? XR minus XL is supposed to tell you where this point has gone in this in the other image, right? That is when you will get your XR and XL. So that is that. Uh, no, no, that is supposed to be a disparity. Now this disparity, right? How do you compute if let's say one of the image becomes blurred? So, okay, your your center may still be all right. I mean, in the sense that right, you may still be blurring about the central ray. But your ability, for example, if you run any shift correspondence or any of the existing features, right, they all make a fundamental assumption that uh, that right, things are sharp, and and especially right, they don't they don't they don't expect when you walk from one image to the other, they don't expect the intensities to change because of blur. In fact, if there is a change in intensity, even because of illumination or something, that could also create trouble. But typically, right, these are taken you know within a very short time, right? So therefore, you don't. It's not like you take one picture in the morning and then one picture in the uh, in the afternoon, right? In which case, there could still be trouble. But then, shift and all is supposed to be partially invariant to illumination, partially invariant to into invariant to post. Okay, not fully invariant. Okay, it is fully invariant to translation, uh, rotation, and all, uh, but but not uh, fully invariant to illumination and post. So this partial invariance, what it actually means is that if for some reason if there is change in intensity, there could be trouble. But you see, trouble becomes more when one of the image, let's say, is actually blurred for some reason, right? I mean, maybe right, you just made it out of focus, or right, you didn't bother to focus this focus image. Then now your ability to get this XR minus XL itself is in trouble now. Your equations are valid so long as you get your XR and XL correctly, right? So the so so there is no issue with this equation per se. This all still holds. But the fact that your ability to get that XR minus XL is now now in uh, sort of say question. Because you 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 wouldn't know where because this guy is smeared out now, no. So to be able to tell that this is exactly that point will 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 be will be harder. Okay, that's what I meant when I said that uh, you know you need both images to be in focus. Okay, not only stereo. In fact, structure from motion. Every one of them typically assumes that assumes that right things. Are, I mean that is the reason right why what happened was when let's say somebody showed in those days right if you were to show somebody a defocused image. Then they would say first, right? Let me take an algorithm that will actually remove all the blur. Okay, so that I can I can operate all of this. And uh, little, right? Did they realize that the blur itself is screaming, right? And telling that hey, here I am carrying a cue for depth, and you are sort of removing me, right? The first thing. Okay, so that's like that, that's a, that's the way the that's the way red people tend to sometimes think, right? So so here, so what I'm saying is, um, so the so the cue for depth, in fact, lies in the fact that. Uh, that you are able to get uh, XR minus XL accurately, and if you can get it for every point, then of course you can have a nice depth map. But it doesn't always mean that right, this is an easy problem, especially if the texture, you know, suppose let's say, suppose let's say that right, you have a smooth texture somewhere here, right? I mean, on a large region, okay, then that then that large region will also exist here. Now, how do you tell which point has moved where? Because everything may look alike, right? So even if you think that things shouldn't have moved too far. But still, even within that region, to be able to pinpointedly tell which point has gone where. For example, I think last time I gave an example. It's something like this. I take an image of this, and then let's say you incline it or something so that there is a depth difference. You take another image. Then how will you match the correspond? How will you get your correspondence? Right? Everything looks the same. Correct. So that's why when we say we we expect the image to have features, we mean the image should have some activity. Right? There should be some changes in intensity. Something should be going on. In which case we can get these matches and also we know that there are things to match. Okay, so the point is this, right? So, so we have, uh, so each one of these, right, can serve as a cue, and because now you know how a pinhole image is formed, and you also know how if you had a lens instead of a pinhole, right, what kind of defocusing can happen, and things need not be blurred, you know, in the same way there could be space here in blur and all that. You have understood all that now. So, so right, going along the same line, what we wanted to do was understand that even, for example, when you have a lens-based uh, Right when you have when you have a when you have uh, let's say defocusing effects, okay, defocusing or as it is called uh, defocusing or in general, right? See, defocus means typically it's or this optical, okay. When somebody says defocus, they mean typically an optical kind of blurring, okay. Otherwise, if they want to be more specific, they will say actually motion blur. In fact, motion blur is also a cue for depth, by the way, okay. But but at this point of time, I want to stick to something more simple, which is actually optical defocus. Okay, so optical defocus, uh, right? This is actually due to lens. Due to lens. Okay, so so here we are assuming that that we have a real aperture camera and we get an image that could be space varying to be blurred. Now, what I wanted to tell you was, if I let's just I'll just pull this uh, image out. Okay, now yeah, right. So we can we can see that playing now. All right. So uh, the other one was actually, I think I told you, right? It's Sai Baba's face on a ring. Correct. I told you it's a ring, no? I told you, right? Now this is uh, this is just three wires, by the way. 
right? Uh, these are just three wires okay, that are being imaged under under a microscope. Now, if I gave you any 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 one, uh, see, there is a, there is a whole bunch of frames, right? That is being played. That's a video. Now, if I stop anywhere, okay, let me see if I, right. If I stop anywhere, okay, suppose I stop here, right? Now, would you be able to tell? See, you know, the whole idea is this, right? Now, we know that if there is a blurring, okay, then actually means that the scene has to be a 3D scene. Right? Because if the scene was perfectly flat, then we know that the lens would have would have either blurred it the same way all over, or of course, you know, it could have completely brought it into focus. Right? Either of these two should have happened. But the fact that right, we can we can see that some portions are probably a little, um, okay, maybe not in this frame. I mean, let me go. Uh -huh. So here, it looks like some things are coming into focus and some things are still blurred and so on. So now it means that it means that you know it is sending out a cue that that you are looking at some kind of a 3D object now. That means all points are not at the same depth from the lens. Now, if you, if, if I told you that, you know, that from this itself, given if I just gave you one image and if I asked you, right, is there a way, is there a way, right, that you can tell uh, where each point is or what kind of a 3D object are you looking at, it's very tough because even if we had some kind of a focus operator, let's say, right, I mean, a measure, if there was, you know, by God, right, if God gave us, you know, all right, a, you know, an operator like that, which we could run all over the image and then it would tell, oh, here is where, you have a you have a very sharp point and there you don't have such a sharp point right if based upon some sharpness right if you could arrive at it right we would still not be able to do it because the you are when you measure sharpness the sharpness is not only a function of the degree of blurring that's going on it's also a function about what is lying underneath right so for example an image okay could have uh, could have a very very high activity in some places and, and kind of very low low activity elsewhere Okay, so over high activity and over low activity, if you had the same blur, let's say, then what would happen is the high activity place, if you try to measure, you may still end up with a with a with an activity that is that is still considerably high because of the fact that because of the fact that your that operator that you're trying to use is only is only is only going to get us a measure something that will tell how active is this region. And the fact that underlying that there is a lot of activity going on. Whereas in some other place, the underlying activity itself is less. So if you superimpose the same amount of blur, you wouldn't know that the blur is the same, because you would think that you know this guy, this guy has less blur. Whereas the fact is, they both have the same blur, but then just that the underlying image has more activity here and then less activity there. Correct. So your ability to be able to tell which is less and which is more blurred and all, with a single image, it's it's very very hard. Right. So which is the reason? Which is the reason why why let's say why let's say people go for go for actually multiple images. Now, if you see, right, that's why, that's why you have a stack. I mean, you can even do it with two, but then this is a, this is a technique that is called shape from focus, okay, and, 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 I, want, and, I, and I want to at least introduce, introduce that to you, okay, as of today, so that you at least understand that. Uh, now, what you're asking is something like an you see, inverse problem, right? Till now, what we had was, we had, right, I gave you a 3D scene, I said that right. This this 3D scene will induce this kind of blur on the image plane, and therefore, and if you assume that the that the images of a certain, let's say, Lena or something, then you could super superimpose. Right, I did that. Right. So then, what you what you get at the output is is a, is a blurred image. So that's like a forward problem. You know, I know I know everything. I know the 3D scene. I know what blur it's going to it's going to introduce. All that I have to do is you know get your image for you. But now what we are asking is what is called an inverse problem. So we are asking, given the image, right, can you actually tell me something about the scene itself, about about my 3D scene? And and that's where we found out that with stereo, if you had two, you could still do. Even with blurring with two, you could still do actually because when you have two, there is some kind of a relative blur that comes into comes into notion now, right? Because you have something. I mean, if you have a reference with respect to which, right, you can do, you can say something about less blur, more blur. It's okay because that reference is unchanged, right? You have two images and they both correspond to the same scene, and one is less blurred, one is more blurred. That that relative degree you can still sense, but this one senses more. Okay, this is not just one or two frames. I'll come to that one. If we have time, I'll talk about the other one, which uses just two. Just as because you know that was motivated by the fact that stereo uses two, so why can't you do it with just two, right? If you had blur also, but uh, but let's go to the other one, right? This one is more intuitive. This one is more reasonable to appreciate. Okay, so here if you see, right? So what you are seeing is a whole. This is called a stack. Okay, now you have a stack, right? You have a stack of frames. Now what what things do you see in this stack? I mean, one. So the whole idea is that this stack is supposed to convey you information about this underlying object, which anyway I plotted there. Right, so there's some algorithm that is run, okay, on this stack which gives you gives you gives you you know a 3D shape of this object, which is how which is how this is supposed to look. I mean, there's a wire and then you know, there's a dip and then there's again a wire, there's the dip, and so on. Okay, 
now how did it uh, how did it sense it right is is what is what we want to know now prior to that i want to ask you what do you see in this image you tell me what are all the things that you see i can repeatedly play if you want one thing is that no single frame appears to be completely in focus is that correct it nowhere can you can you pick a frame it will be you no know, which looks like which looks like all in focus right something is going on somewhere right something is getting blurred then something becomes focused something becomes focused then the other the other thing is other thing is getting blurred other than that what i wanted to tell you was okay now if i if i tell you what is going on now you tell me right it's like actually having a lens at the top which is a microscope right it's looking at this object through a lens and there is a and there is a and there is a uh, what do you call it a z stage okay so the z stage is the one that is being moved okay so so you have kept this object on this so this is just a small right three wires and you kept them there and then and then basically what you're doing is you're trying to you you just you're probably moving it upwards or you're, or you're moving this stay downwards and this guy remains right there now if i do something like that something should happen no what should be that what should it that the what should be that should happen there should be some scaling effect that you should probably see right right i mean you imagine no right i'm i'm going like back and forth i'm going front i'm coming closer or i'm going farther off right i'm translating along the optical axis right? when i do something like that you would typically expect that something should get magnified okay what i mean what you seem to think this magnification is actually a parallax okay but to our eye it's not so clear so we seem to think that there's some scaling going on but in simple terms right it looks like some scaling should have happened but if you see here right it looks like every point is sitting right there nothing is moving now such as this one is called really a telecentric a telecentric lens okay now we will not go into the details of this telecentric lens but but then right, i mean you know, i'll i'll kind of later on right I'll revisit this but right now okay so so our idea is to motivate shape from focus we call it as you know sff it stands for shape from focus so what this means is that just as we had shape from x so shape from a disparity was earlier now we are looking at shape from focus as a q so this uses what is called what is called a, uh, what is called a telecentric setup so in fact most of your optical microscopes and all come with this kind of a telecentric setup which is called a telecentric lens what is telecentric lens simply means uh, actually right this is uh, this is used in all industrial applications so they come because right what they want is if you keep something right if you keep an object like this okay if you have a lens here and then you have an object here okay some object here and then and then you see an image right on the image plane now now if let's say later if they want to match this object with something and if they keep the object slightly away they don't want this image size to change okay they just want right they don't they don't like you know some magnification going on and so on just because right you have moved the object a little farther or you know, a little closer right so in order to account for this what what is normally done is in a kind of a telecentric setup what is done is you 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 introduce an extra aperture okay at exactly focal length away from the lens center either on this side or on this side depending upon where you introduce you get image side telecentricity or what is called object side telecentricity that is okay i mean right? we don't have to go to the details object side means that you can move on the object side and then there is no magnification uh, telecentric image telecentric image side telecentricity means that this image plane can be moved and the object can be right there and the image can be moved and then you still won't see any kind of magnification okay this simply and this is more from an industrial yeah, industrial perspective where people like you know like a setup like that because then they don't have to worry about extra factors and factors like this which they feel that are unnecessary to kind of say deal with but then this is exactly the point that shape from focus exploits and by the way right uh, I, i hope i told you that uh, that this method right is actually attributed to uh, attributed to one one indian okay his name is sri nair okay so on that way we should be actually proud of uh, the fact that our own person right, did, a, did a lot of work in this so his name is sri nair at columbia right so his father by the way was a, his grandfather was a freedom fighter i believe okay so so so, so it was he who came up with this idea and uh, he and he said that if you had really a telecentric setup 